Thank you. So, I guess it's a little bit morning. It was a very good afternoon. It's a good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks for having me, and um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to talk to you uh, on this topic. So, what I'm going to do today, and I'm going to try this as a new, new approach on my, on my part here. Um, so I'm actually going to try and, there's three things I'm going to talk about. The one is really about the spectrum database. The, the second is about some regulatory restrictions that uh, follows out of that. Um, and then the third one I'll briefly touch on the white paper that we as Viper have um, produced around the spectrum. So what I'm going to try with you in this first section is to go really way out there. Right. So think of a bit of a pie in the sky in mind. And, and bear with me as I take you through a bit of a journey as to what if, right, a practical approach to actually using a uh, spectrum database. And then we'll talk a little bit about the regulatory part of that. So, let me try this pointer. So, you may have seen, or you may be aware of WAPA, the Wireless Access Providers Association. We are now 220 plus members. Our members are um, traditionally been the WISPs, the smaller wireless internet service providers. But we do also have some of the largest um, internet service providers also as part of our membership. We also have uh, joining a lot of the vendors, the guys that actually distribute and even manufacture equipment in South Africa, as well as service providers in terms of integrators and those kind of things. So we're, we're quite proud about the, the, the role that we as WAC have played and the members that we actually represent. And you know, as the picture shows, we all the way from the small dogs to the big dogs. So what I want to take you through in an age of instant, right? So if you imagine our children today, um, and that picture there, I found that on the internet, that was just so, so uh, speaks so much of, our, of the generation of, of our children, who are just so used to things happening now, right? So that picture of them looking in the oven and going, when are these cookies going to be ready, right? This is so, so true of, of the generation that's coming, and even our own generation, we so become so used to things happening very, very quickly, um, and having results really quickly and our children are going to be even more so. So what I want to take you through is a practical approach of spectrum application, a license application. And the picture here donated to us by one of our members, WhisperNet. So the traditional way of this would have been you go out to your high side, you go and figure out, you know, can I see the other side that I'm trying to get a connection to? And then you go through a whole process of applying for a license with the regulator. But imagine the following scenario. So sort of think of the guy standing there with his tablet. If you had an application that not is a point and shoot, but is a point and link budget application, right, that allowed you to, for example, stand in Cape Town on Command Cop, and with your tablet in your hand, you would point it at the site that you're trying to get to, which in this case is the Tiger Hospital, and you're trying to create a link now to there. And the application actually allows you to do a link budget instantly, right? Um, you can take your mouse and you can finger around to get the right location where you want it um, and you get a immediate link budget also tells you the link availability a very important aspect of any backhaul or enterprise time connectivity that you can produce. Now you take it one further and you say well let me select a type approved equipment right and in my previous slide would have noticed I was looking at 17 gigabits which would be license exempt but maybe I make the choice and say I actually want to try and use a licensed equipment so I immediately want to see what is my annual license going to be. Um, I want to see what kind of throughput I'm going to get. And you know, having looked at type approved equipment, um, the application will tell me what the optimal frequency is as per ECASA's um, spectrum fees calculator. And then I do an online application. And the online application would at the bottom basically say, on the link that you're trying to do, We've already know that there's sterilized, we sterilized sterilize the area from here to there. And we know that the following channels are still available for you to choose. And you can choose that channel and even possibly get back the maximum power that you would be allowed to use. And you go ahead and submit application and within a couple of minutes you get your email back with your license number. Now that would be kind of really, really cool for any guy, whether they're a small dog in the industry or a big dog in the industry, because it's all about rapid deployment, all about getting services done really, really quickly, right? That age of instant. Now, I did call the licensee wishful thinking because it's still very much out there. Now, 
Why am I taking you through this example? Because on the back of this thing would be some sort of a database. And that database would have information about where the transmitter is, where the receiver are, where all the transmitters, all the receivers are, I should say, what the spectrum allocations are for the different bands, what the spectrum assignments are for the frequency assignments that have been done within those bands, and it would tell you that we are to simulate the propagation by right, the new budget pilot. Reversely, you could also from it understand which are the unassigned frequencies, right? And you could even get up where the white spaces are. Now, I've taken you through this little journey because in my mind, I get a lot of people asking, you know, TV white space, why is it important? Why is white really involved in TV white space? And then the question, of course, always, why is Google and Microsoft involved in this? I mean, they don't really do spectrum, they don't really their space. And really what it's about, ladies and gentlemen, is the database. Because you can, you, can you see that if you have a database, and the more information that you can put into the database, the new flexibility that you have coming out of it, and the way that we could, as you know, as a industry, change publicly how we do things. Now, I'm going to take you to the next slide and tell you that when that happens, and that's why you know, the CSR, for example, is working on these kind of databases. When that happens, spectral management will change. It won't be management as in the old days, you know, where is it licensed, is it licensed, is it licensed exempt, or is it a managed spectrum park? Instead, if you have a database, those things might fall away, and you might have to rethink how we even do spectrum management. And I would put it out to the to the regulator to start thinking, right, and this is where WAPR, uh, in particular, is, is very keen to work with the regulator, and that's why we started at the Future Wireless Technology Forum, to say there's technology out there that is changing the way we do things. And the, the thing here is, whilst the regulator today has to obviously specify um, the technical parameters around spectrum and the use of the spectrum, but what's probably going to be far more important in that database, if I can go back one slide, can go back one, what's most important in that database is not just compliant to the, to, the, to the rules and the specification, but the behavior of that spectrum database. If two if a query is sent to two databases, both databases should come back with the same answer. The rules and the behavior of the database is really important and that needs to be specified. And I think if anything, if there's a challenge in the industry and also to the regulators to say, how do we define the behavior and the results that the database gives out? So that's a seed I want to plant in your minds to say, there's a really, really exciting time coming, and the thing that excites me most about being in South Africa in this particular instance is that we're actually part and parcel of, of creating that future here, in the likes of CSR and in the likes of the trials that we'll be doing in Cape Town. Right, the next topic I want to talk to you about, and I'll come back to that database again, is it's all about backhaul. Now I say that from my personal experience of having designed wireless microwave networks. For two years, I had a design line on my desk for two towns in South Africa, medium-sized towns. I worked it all out. This is how I was going to do last mile access to provide internet connectivity into these towns. I couldn't get it into implementation phase because it just wasn't feasible to backport it. It was only at some point, if I remember correctly, we had a mine out in, in Pumaranga that actually then came along and said, we, signing up to buy a service from, this, from you guys. And at that point, the feasibility was there. We had enough aggregated backhaul capacity to actually go and build an entire backhaul ring back to Joburg. Now, that brings me to the idea of saying, okay, hold on. We, we have companies in South Africa now that, are, that have established themselves all around sharing infrastructure, right? Our member of American Towers Corporation, also a member of WAPA, they, have done exactly that. They're all about sharing infrastructure, sharing the towers. Right? Makes a lot of sense, and it works. And you could obviously go now think further and say, okay, well, if I can share the tower, how about I share the backhaul with another service provider, with another operator? So as to kind of get that scale of the backhaul and hence drop the cost down, so that the overall project and the overall cost to the end user comes down. Fair enough, right? OK. 
can we share the equipment? See, right now the regulation says you have to own and operate the equipment that you have the frequency license assigned for. That's a challenge. Now, if you look at that little, door, uh, little town, I think this is Uppington, um, if you imagine a WISP, a small player out there, they've got a little high side and they're providing some very good internet connectivity, both in terms of broadband and both in terms of enterprise to the likes of this town. But their backhaul is the most expensive part. On the same time, there are these number of towns in South Africa where it just doesn't really make sense for the big operators to go. We call them underserviced areas. And they can't go there because it just isn't feasible for them to do. 80% of their money they're probably making the big urban areas. And this, this stuff out there is expensive for them to do. Um, now, if you could, on the other hand, split out so that the little wisp in this little town could provide both his own services as well as provide services for a major operator, then the backhaul starts to become feasible again. Now I want to take you to a, one of our members, Radwin. Um, I'm, you know, it's one at the top of the head when I think about an oil one equipment. I saw this presentation two years ago. There are other manufacturers out there who do similar things. But the key thing for me here, and this is one of the reasons why I launched the Future Wireless Technology Forum, because it's all about technology and what it's able to do for us. Here is an all-in-one box. I think of it as the all-in-one box. They call it the Radwin 6 files, if I remember correctly. For the power consumed by a light bulb, under 60 watts, less than 60 watts, they're able to put up this box that can provide cellular, Wi-Fi, as well as fixed access, so there's Ethernet ports on the bottom of this thing, so you can plug in, for example, uh, a monitoring camera to, to make sure that the guys aren't coming to steal your solar panels and batteries, a very common problem for the service providers in the outlying areas, right? And the backhaul is built into this already as well. However, notice I've put a, a crossed out across the cellular frequencies there. That cellular frequency is owned in terms of the license, frequency license by the major cellular operators. And so this stops a small operator from deploying this in a small town. But imagine they already have the Wi-Fi customers, they already have the enterprise customers in that town. They are the Mr. IT in that little door. And if they could deploy this and get a Vodacom or an MTN as examples, to climb in the back of this and say, okay, we will share the aggregated backhaul with you. Can you see how the cost of internet will come down for the people in that little town? And that's a change. However, our regulations right now don't allow for it. And that's one of the things I think is really, really important to think about when we think about regulations. So, somehow we need to separate the three, the equipment owner, the spectrum license holder and the network operator. Okay. So as I mentioned this to um, William Stuckey, uh, you know, well, I guess he's still counsel until the end of the week or something, right? I mentioned this to William Stuckey, and you know how he is. He comes back and says, he laughs at me. He goes, yes, are you trying to do local loop on bumming or wireless? And I said, well, not really. Not kind of, right? But the point is, it is some sort of an un separating those three so that a new economy and a new business model can actually come out of this. It's really about enabling new players to go into places where they already are and to use the existing big operators to work with them. And we as WAP have done some, some great initiatives on that already, uh, where, for example, our smaller players, the smaller operators, are working hand in hand with our bigger, bigger members like Neotel and using Neotel's product service on a wholesale basis to enable them to get better services out there. Now, if we can do that on fiber, or we can't do it in wireless. And that's the challenge in terms of the regulations today. Right, and then I want to quickly take you through, actually maybe a last point to that previous one. If you imagine this scenario, uh, and we kind of take it really far out there, about right, 10, 15 years from now, you can obviously see that if we have a spectrum database, 
that we could take this not only to the operators in our country who we think of today in terms of 3G and 2G operators, but we could even go to the extent of, of enabling maybe other operators where uh, consumers who come into our country could be not roaming on a network, but could actually be assigned temporarily some spectrum, right? Where it is then licensed not by a one of the local operators, but by the, a, an operator from a neighboring country. So the database, again, the possibilities that the database brings with it is, is huge. And that is also why I believe it's such an important thing that you know, the big players in databases, the guys that understand how to search things, are such key players in this environment. Okay, so let me take you to our, um, our, our vision on, on our position on spectrum. This is a white paper that uh, the, uh, the Wireless Access Provider Association has published. Um, and why why did we write a white paper? It's all about um, it's all about getting better broadband into South Africa, and we know that it has a definite drive of economic economic growth. Um, you may have seen this slide yesterday already. <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's good. But I quickly want to talk about TV spectrum, and, and uh, you know, I take great notes in the presentation before me. Um, from from Apple's perspective, of course, we're very very keen. Our members are really really keen to be able to use the white space, the TV white space in particular. And we, in, you know, we, we encourage government and regulator to to expedite that process of um, opening up um, the digital dividend. Band. And in particular, what, uh, what is very important is also the whole LTE network around that. So we, make, we need to come up with ideas that um, allow more players to be able to provide LTE networks. I want to touch on something, and that might be a little controversial, but this is a tweet very recently from Dr. McLeod. And Aurelius says, with the exception of the occasional live sports game, I haven't watched linear broadcast television all this year, it's become irrelevant. That's an interesting one because I recently bought, at the beginning of the year, I think I bought a smart TV. So it's a TV with a YouTube player built into it. And I watch my kids, I would say between 60 and 70% now, they watch YouTube on the TV and not linear broadcast on the And we see a whole bunch of you know, uh, demand, or it's a TV on demand, broadcast on demand, sort of players coming, you know, video on demand, I should say, video on demand players coming into the market. Um, and it's, it's an interesting one because in my mind I keep asking, and I've asked this question already about a year ago, um, does it still make sense to invest the kind of money to go to a digital broadcasting environment, terrestrial broadcasting environment, when more and more people will, over time, switch to the internet for video on demand? I mean, we know that right now it's something that maybe you know, people with high-end tablets and high-end smartphones are using. But we're seeing not only the features of those features coming into more affordable handsets and devices, but we're also seeing the priority of people changing to say, you know, a, a smartphone or equivalent type device has become essential in our day-to-day -day lives. Something to think about. The other thing to think about, and I must confess, I have recently joined a satellite company, so I've used satellite capacity. But this is an opinion I had previously, and those that know me and have seen me speak before will know that I already had this opinion prior to joining the satellite company. I'll say that as a disclaimer, but I don't mind if you have a, you see this as a bit of a lobby. On a satellite, there's so much more spectrum available from a broadcasting perspective than what you're ever going to achieve in the spectrum on the terrestrial. So it just seems to make more sense that you can get more and more SD and HD channels from a satellite perspective because you've got so many satellites to look at it as well. Um, but I think from an economic perspective, from a country's perspective, it makes a lot more sense to try and see how much can we do locally to get internet onto those spectrum and not so much to broadcast. But that's my opinion. 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz, those are obviously the spectrum that the, the weather you know, the, the, the original web players, if I may call them so, uh, started off with. You know, they're all working in the uh, license exempt spectrum. 
and it, it's a, plays a pivotal part in, in our um, what, you know, in the West world even today. It does have its challenges because, of course, with so many people out there, it causes these other interference issues. Um, and so we look at, I see my picture's going a bit weird there, but um, we do look to ICASA not to regulate that spectrum, but to at least make sure that A, um, any type of proof equipment is used out there. So that's a very, very important aspect. And the other one is to ensure that uh, people stick to the specifications. At the same time, we, we do appeal to the cost to, to provide a more clear process when it comes to exemptions on the transmit power. So to give some examples of that, a point-to-point -point link, if you wanted to go across the sort of Kruger National Park as an example, um, you would not be able to get the link availability, right, uh, even at 5.8 gigahertz, because of the rain rate and the distances that you need to cover at 100 milliwatts EYF. So it seems to make sense that we need some exemptions of, uh, in terms of those types of examples where, for example, um, you would allow a higher output power because you're not going to be causing any interference in that area in the first place. You're simply just trying to get from this point to that point with a high link availability. And keep in mind that automatic power control, which is now a standard feature of most of these uh, radios, you would only be exceeding those power limitations when it rains. There's no, way, there's no reason for the radio to be transmitting that power all the time because it would just be consuming a lot of your battery power. So you know, you're trying to bring the cost on the infrastructure all the time. So you know, we do look to, again, we, we look to the cars to give us a more clear process on that. And then um, one of the largest concerns that we have at the moment is you know, we, we see the, the network operators coming into the Wi-Fi offloading space great thing. On the other hand, it just means that the spectrum is going to get even more congested. And to add to that level of congestion, um, there is development of LTE in these bands. So operators looking to use, to deploy LTE networks in license exempt bands, purely because they don't have anywhere else to go. So that actually in itself then again speaks to the idea of guys, we really, really need to get the 2.6 gigs and the 800 meg stuff sorted out for LTE. So as the operators go and work in, the, in those license bands and license exam bands. 3.4 and 3.6 gigahertz, this is for traditionally the, the WiMAX spectrum, if I may call it that. Um, as we see it at the moment, it's not very not utilized very well, but it's a great spectrum for broadband type services. So here we, we really look at and our sort of recommendations we should be looking at managed spectrum. 17 gigahertz. So, 17 gigahertz is an, an interesting spectrum. I've actually tried, you know, I, I was busy doing some network designs based on that. Now, key thing with license exam, of course, it means that you can deploy very quickly. It's a rapid deployment because you don't have to go through the process of getting a license you know, for a spectrum license. Trouble with it is that right now it's still limited to 100 milliwatts per hour. So, let me explain what that means. In Johannesburg, as I was trying to do, if you're going to go from one to a top of a hill to another top of the hill, for example, one water tower to another water tower. In many instances, you cannot get decent link availability, in other words, 99.7% availability, because of the heavy rain rate that we have in Germany. Under normal circumstances, under clear sky conditions, you may be using as much as 20 or 30 milliwatts of, of transmit power. But when it rains, you need to obviously increase the power, so the automatic power control needs to take place. And it needs to exceed 100 milliwatts in order to maintain that link for 99.7% of the time. So our biggest request here is to say we really need to rethink 17 gigahertz from a point-to-point -point perspective and say, can we not um, increase the power limitations on this? The, the technology certainly can do it. It's just a regulatory restriction at the moment. The other one is that um, the vendors themselves have actually tried to uh, create sort of databases in the form to uh, coordinate the spectrum at 70 gigahertz to avoid the kind of issues that our guys are experiencing at 5.8. Um, and suggestions there are to say maybe at least from a compliance perspective it needs to be a, a, a compulsory registration is required um, for 17 gig spectrum. 
so that that at least, that at least can be coordinated. Now again, I find it interesting when we talk about this because think of the spectrum database I talked about earlier on. These kind of things will disappear one day. Hence my question saying spectrum management one day will actually be a very different thing. 24 gigahertz is interesting because the guys that are manufacturing 17 gigahertz are also manufacturing 24 gigahertz equipment. Now in some parts of the world, 24 gigahertz is also allowed to be used for um, internet service providers and other to provide data and more services out. In ITU1, and that thus also we have uh, currently that restriction in South Africa, it is dedicated and uh, it's allocated purely for short range devices. However, from what we've worked on and seen, yeah, I don't believe that a point-to-point a -point data service will interfere with the short-range devices. And even if it does, um, the question is how, how significant is that, right? Um, but if you imagine you've got these radius up on a mast, point-to-point um, -point at 24 gigahertz with the sort of narrow beam woods that you have, why would it interfere with a radar system in your car? So the recommendation here and the request is we really like to see 24 gigahertz being uh, used the same or allocated the same way that 17 gigahertz is being allocated. And also, on top of that, of course, the power, uh, the slightly higher power outputs so that we can get the high availabilities. Really making this useful. Keep in mind that this is the, the key thing about this kind of equipment it's off the shelf equipment, there's more licensed spectrum equipment. You typically have to order from overseas six to eight weeks. This is really rapid deployment stuff. Okay, 60 gigahertz. So this was the first session of the Future Wireless Technology Forum. It was all about the millimeter waves, so 40 gigahertz or 30 gigahertz and up. And um, 60 gigahertz, it, the oxygen in the air actually attenuates the spectrum so badly that you'd be lucky to do anything more than two kilometers at this frequency. Now, that's a great feature because it means that I can put a wireless access point in this room and it's just not going to go very far. But within this room, I can get gigabits of transfer rates. Which is why Wi Fi 802 and AD has latched onto that. At the same time, we already, I'm, I'm convinced, we've already got this equipment in South Africa. But regulatory wise, it's actually not really allowed. We don't, we don't type approve anything above the spectrum. And if anything, you can get a test cluster. The stuff's already coming in the country, you can't stop it. It's in laptops, it's in cell phones, it's in all sorts of things. So our push, and, and, and you know, we really, really need this to be Worldwide it is seen as license exempt. Um, hence you've got the Wi-Fi, the wire gigs, and so on, we're already using it. The spectral reuse, if you think about it, is probably the highest at this frequency. So if you think about the example I just mentioned in this room, we could have a gigahertz, that's 60 gigahertz. And that same frequency could be re re reused in the room next door. I don't know anything that is that has that high spectral frequency reuse. Now, at 80 gigahertz, that attenuation due to oxygen falls away again, and it behaves in its normal um, free space loss environment. So here, we're able to do up to 10 kilometers of um, distances with the radio links. But again, if you look at the 80 gigahertz, we're able to do 1, 2, 4 gigahertz and larger ones coming in the future of data through. In other words, this is a rapid deployment of fiber-like speeds over wireless. Right now, we can only get a test license for it. We really, really need um, this stuff to be, to be uh, taken into, into, into account as the regulators. <coughs> And to be as like, we re look at it as again license exempt. Why? Because it's such narrow spectrum. At that kind of an uh, sorry, like such narrow beam was, you're not going to cause a bunch of interference. It's almost like a laser pencil beam going across. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, when we had the uh, Future Wireless Technology Forum, we actually had guys presenting free space optics, so the guys that do laser uh, lasers through the air, and E band radios. And they actually put them side by side. Because what happens is the 80 gigahertz rain rate rain affects it, and laser is affected by fog. But lasers are not affected so much by rain, and 80 gigahertz is not so much affected by fog. So if you put the two next to each other, you actually have a full redundant system. 
Again, right now, earband radios, there are a couple of them out there. We've got a couple of test licenses out there. Um, but we could actually build huge networks on this very, very quickly. So that's it for me. Um, you know, happy to take some questions. As I said, we, we have been writing as Wapper and um, we, we look forward and we are already working very much with the class and continue to look forward to working with the class on, on the topics that we have in common. Just an interesting sort of call of the side. A lot of the corridor discussions and some of the presentations yesterday addressed the touched on a number of issues that you've raised, perhaps a bit more eloquently than some of us. We talked very much, for example, about something like a number of portability database to control the value spectrum so that you actually register but not regulate all spectrum. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter if you, then, if you don't need the kind of Cray computer type approach that the geolocation spectrum <coughs> databases need for white space network. But you can have a fairly low end server that just sort of keeps track of who's mm -hmm. using what. That, that is some way to solve some of the problems that you mentioned. You, you did say that you're not too worried about some of the interference that some of the bandwidths would create with uh, things like your, your very low end devices. Well, having had experience with a certain large operator who put a tower in about two blocks from my home, and the garage doors opened and closed, the car door locked and unlocked, and the alarm went off. So it's not a so what, it's a very real issue. And I think the issue you mentioned yesterday that everybody forgets the consumer, the consumer power and the high power. And the growing movement where people are more and more vocal. The example we used yesterday was that if it wasn't for <coughs> things like Twitter, you would never have the Arab Spring. So you've got to be very aware of what can happen to you because of the public sentiment. Um, so, just a quick comment on, on your garage door. Yeah. We've heard this the last time, and it's a future wireless technology forum as well. The, the, the key problem there is that typically those receivers are of an older technology, uh, equivalent to an analog, or uh, well, so if I can say it like that. Um, if you had a scrambled um, remote and receiver, that should certainly not happen. So that's the thing to think about is, you know, those, in other words, it's also just as easy if, if, if a interfering signal can create that to happen on your camera for opener. It's also very easy for a criminal to come along and just have a very simple transmitter and actually create that. That's exactly what does happen. That's why yeah. the Germans did that. But let me put it to you this way: you know, in our area, there were about ten of us experiencing the same problem. Mm -hmm. We eventually complained to Cost, who actually got hold of the culprit and just forced them to deattenuate because it was all the problem was that they attenuate. Mm -hmm. The issue is who would go and replace those costs? Mm -hmm. Just the remote costs you 30, 40 rand. It may not sound like money, but when you start talking about lots of remotes. Devices sitting inside your alarm system. You know, you took about serious money to that. You can't just watch. Oh, you're starting to behave like big business. Let me put it this way. And this yeah. is the one thing that people are really handy is big business to pay. But having said that, now you said one of the problems is that you want to be able to, to for example, share uh, some of the components of wireless so that you can use some of the mobile backup. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you just simply become a service provider of one of the operators and therefore you're not using the else's support? Well, that's the problem because the, this, this, the equipment has to be owned and operated by, that, by the major operator. It is the number operator owns the number of the spectrum that you have become a service provider, which means that so that's the value to you use. Be an owner, but effectively, it means that that equipment needs to be built, obviously, to be purchased, installed, uh, and, and operated by a voter operating team. What I'm saying is a small guy, push, uh, think of it a, a, a small wisp somewhere, right? Um, they can, the, the idea is that they can be a provider and say to an operator, I have this equipment, don't you want to partner with me on this? That's exactly what a service provider would give you. But it's, it's a question of going to sleep with the enemy and you go and talk to them. It gives them a way possibly as well, so providing a little more than just simply that one of you. Anyway, that was just completely from the floor.
um, in, the, in, the, in the lower, below 1 gigahertz uh, area. I mean, now we're talking about frequencies that are higher. And I mean, there's, there's what you said, 30 gigahertz, and there comes 24 gigahertz, and then there comes 60 gigahertz. What is all between those? those bands that we were talking about. I mean, if you look at the spectrum plan here, I see Earth exploration, satellites, radio astronomy, are they doing horoscopes there, or what are they doing on the spectrum? I mean, isn't it time for a review of, of, of I mean, the, the whole spectrum plan? I mean, uh, I think this ITU, because it's, it's a copy and paste from the ITU that was done maybe 50 years ago, and when everything was analog, there was nothing digital. I think it's, it's time for, for, for a massive review of, of, of all of this but I mean, if we, if we can really have like, 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 like uh, something like a full five to ten gigahertz, twenty to twenty-five gigahertz, that will solve obviously all our problems because then we don't have to, sh to, to look like interference because then there will be enough space. Isn't it? So, sure. I mean, I totally agree. There's, there's, there's and that's for example, twenty-four gigahertz was is other kind of for short range devices. Now, way back when, the short range devices would have been interfered as the gentleman just said in terms of the garage door opening. Yeah. Right. But with digital modulation, as you all know yourself, if you have digital modulation and encryption on it, um, you won't have that, that, that issue anymore. The trouble is, as was also pointed out, is there is already equipment out there. So, how do you ensure that you don't interfere, interfere with that? For example, a classic example of that is TV white space. Now, you, you had to try and do trial where you could prove that you know, the really the oldest TV set wasn't going to be interfered with by this new te digital te uh, modulation. So I think, I think the interesting thing that comes out of this is that what we really are looking at, and this is a worldwide phenomenon of disruptive technologies, we think uh, getting an end in real suffer mentalities and stop thinking about a very narrow viewpoint from a free and reinvent the way we do things. Keeps coming out over and over again. So, yes, uh, you alluded to free space optics. Hmm. Uh, what about safety issues related to usage of uh, free space optics? Because I think it is in uh, it's very high frequency. That's no, it's lasers. Right, it's a laser light, light, red light or something like that. Uh, it's very, very high, and it's out there in the open. And I just would like to ask you about the implication with regard to safety, and uh, also because it is a point-to-point -point kind of uh, scenario, what do you do in terms of uh, impinging on human beings, uh, bear in mind from a physics point of view, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And of course you alluded to 60 gigahertz, etc. I think one should also consider the implication of the energy that you are transmitting there and find out precisely, you know, uh, what are the health implications and safety implications of uh, utilizing these higher frequencies free space uh, optics. Okay, so let's not mix a couple of things. First of all, the, I'm not an expert at, at free space optics, but um, my, my view on it is that you're going point to point between two buildings, um, and in order to get your eyeball into that, into there, you would have to literally be direct, maybe directly behind the other device or get your eye in, in front of it, right? Um, but it doesn't, of course, take away the responsibility of somebody already turned it and pointed it somewhere. Um, so, again, I, I'm not an expert at the, at the respect of this, but I'm not as, to be honest with you, my, my initial gut feeling is I'm not so concerned unless somebody actually purposefully were to use it to um, try and point at somebody. But then that's probably the same as trying to use a gun on somebody. Right. Um, in terms of you made the statement that the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So, at the output of the transmitter, uh, a milliwatt is a milliwatt, irrespective of the frequency. But, your antennas are higher gain, right? so at the higher the frequency goes up, the, uh, the same size antenna they will actually increase the gain. So, the 
ER and P value would be higher. However, the higher the frequency, the higher the attenuation of the distance. So, in order to, and that's one of the reasons why the higher you are going in frequency, the less of the distance you're able to cover. Because of the attenu attenuation, if you look at the free space loss curve of the frequency, it's, it has a bit of a um, non-linear approach, it almost has a bit of a logarithmic approach to it. And so, the higher you go your own frequency, by the time that you're a kilometer away, at 80 gigahertz, my energy you be feeling there versus what you had at VHF levels will be quite significantly different. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we started to eat lunchtime now. Some of you, are, I can hear your stomachs rumbling. So, I think it's a good time to, to say thank you very much to Jens. And, uh, he's here. And should, but if you want to keep him from lunch, you're welcome to do so. He's just button on the line and talk. So just, it's going to be